So uh, some brave soul has to seize the initiative. There he is. I had a, a question about yesterday's um, talk about hypnagogia. Uh huh. From there, okay, first there was uh, phosphines. Right. And then hypnagogia. And right. then you went from hypnagogia to vision. And I thought, where does the dream state come in? Because um, usually the. Well, I think we were talking about visual the visual field the dream state is like a vision except that it's not emotionally charged in quite the same way that vision is it's almost a difference in emotional quality rather than the visual impression uh, I mean do you agree does yeah, that I, I think so when I'm dreaming though I, I get more of the feeling of, of a of a um, right, very emotional time, but when I'm in vision, it's more like rapture, um, which I guess is high emotion, but... That's what I, my analysis of it is, that it's touching you at a deeper emotional level. But it's interesting, this question you raise about dreams, we were talking last week, it's fairly common among people who use psychedelics to have dreams in which the the psychedelic actually appears as a motif and then you take it and then you have the experience in the dream. And I've even had this with DMT, which is to my mind the strongest psychedelic. So it's very interesting because it's almost, it's a perfect case proving that really you can do it all yourself. In other words, that the chemical precondition is there in deep sleep. Yeah, Eric. Uh, do you think memory is um, more or less instead of memory being something you remember uh, in the sense of uh, <coughs> replaying something, but that it actually takes you back to the moment or something? That, and so you mean that it could be an extremely strong memory of a psychedelic state? Yeah. That's a possibility. I, it's pretty interesting I don't know. I, I've had very puzzling experiences, maybe some of you have as well, around the theme of memory and psychedelics. I remember once in the Amazon, I, I had had a wonderful mushroom trip and I took it again the next night to try and re reach the same place again. And instead I had this very bizarre trip in which I recalled with perfect clarity the basement of my aunt's house some 20 years before and I saw myself playing alone in the basement on a certain sunny summer afternoon with uh, a little circus set that I had and as I played with this circus set DMT stuff began leaking out of the air in front of me and here I was, 20 years later, seeing this as though I were reliving a memory of a five-year-old child say, you know, seeing the stuff that he couldn't tell his parents about, couldn't tell anybody about. So, you know, is that a hallucination? Is that a memory? What is it? It's interesting in talking all the talk we've done about hallucinations to introduce the concept of a cognitive hallucination. A cognitive hallucination is where you don't see something that isn't ordinarily there. You understand something that isn't ordinarily there. An example of this is I had a friend in San Francisco who I had told him, you know, when you take the mushrooms, stay in your apartment in the dark. Just be with them. I told him this maybe ten times. So he takes the mushrooms... An hour into it, he realizes uh, in such a way that just causes him to laugh aloud that I had been kidding. <laughs> that that wasn't what I had meant at all. <laughs> that what I had really meant was to do that because we were preparing a surprise birthday party for him at the bar <laughs> down the street. So congratulating himself over the fact that he's figured out this cleverness that we've launched upon him. He dresses himself and gets ready, goes down to this bar and bursts in the front door and says, I'm here! <laughs> 
the story goes from there, but that's the part about cognitive hallucinations. Um, and of course, sometimes a cognitive hallucination will stand up. Then it becomes a new truth and uh, passes into the meme wars as a competing uh, member. What else is on people's minds here? Just... I'm real curious about the, about the phenomena of, of ex- when you're on the mushrooms and you experience it's like other entities, other intelligence. And I, I've like tried dialoguing with this thing, like asking, are you a hallucination? Are you real? What are you? And it's like, and I, I just can't tell. I just cannot tell whether it's real or whether I'm hallucinating it or whether I'm creating it or whether it's another part of me that's separated from me or it's a, it's a cluster of neurons that's disassociated from the rest of my brain or something. And, it's just like the most the most puzzling thing to me. Not any insight you can give into that experience. Well, I think that's the core puzzling experience when you meet the other organized as a speaking mind. And uh, I've wondered these same things, asked it what it is. It seems to be able to present itself many different ways. I mean, it can be almost like a robotic, cybernetic, disembodied kind of thing. Or sometimes it's like, you know, your girlfriend in hyperspace. It has this very sexy kind of, uh, I don't know, these funny vibes to be coming off a pharmaceutical product. Uh, <laughs> And, but it might as well be another intellect because it seems like it. It seems as different from you as the person sitting next to you, at least that different from you. So I treat it that way. I don't know, you know, perhaps people have always heard voices in states of high uh, agitation or stimulation. We don't know what to do with that kind of thing because it's not in our tradition. But it's a shocking reality. I mean, for anybody who thinks plants don't talk, it's a real life reorienting experience to have one then harangue you. <laughs> and uh, I didn't think plants talked. I didn't. I had friends who claimed this, and I, my dream was really to reach to figure out what these people could possibly mean. that you actually hear them talking? I mean, because I don't hear voices. It's more like images and feelings and sensations. Well, it has many modalities. It can be, a, like with ayahuasca, it seems to be truly a visual communicator. Its mode is vision. It shows you what it intends. But the mushroom actually speaks. It delivers itself of little aphorisms. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've heard me try to sum them up for people. I mean, it's said things to me like, uh, man must have a plan. If you don't have a plan, you'll become part of somebody else's plan. It's said, um, nature loves courage. The way nature responds to courage is by removing obstacles. Well, these are things that you're middle track Zen guru could probably come up with. But then it says other things which are completely puzzling. It says things like uh, what you call man is time. And then sometimes it, it, you know, it is humorous. I mean, hilariously, insanely humorous. It's like having Groucho Marx in bed with you. <laughs> I mean, so sometimes it, it has a certain... Rod Steiger-esque kind of uh, Jewish persona. I remember one conversation I had with it where I was said, what are you doing here? And it said, listen, you're a mushroom, you live cheap. <laughs> and I said, can I go back to my audiences and report that this is what the extraterrestrial said? You're a mushroom, you live cheap. Uh, said, you know, the neighborhood wasn't so bad till the monkeys moved in. Uh, I'll tell a funny story about this thing, about the, the Jewish persona of the mushroom, because I was, it's a standard story of mine. 
that I tell. And I was in a restaurant in Malibu uh, with Bob Chartoff and Lou Carlino, who some of you know, a bunch of fancy Hollywood-type people. And there was this French uh, producer there, this woman, and she and I had been seated together at dinner. And she said, you see that the mushroom speaks to you, but I don't understand how this can be. What do you mean it speaks to you? And, I, in, and Ralph Abraham was there too, and I, in my sincere way, said, well, it's like the part Steiger played in The Pawnbroker. It just... And at that moment, Steiger stops by the table to shake hands with everybody there. And I'm like... <laughs> and... <clears throat> true story, true story. And Ralph who's watched this whole thing go down, leans across the room, leans across the table to me and says, what this proves is the mushroom can reach into our world no matter where we are and shake the bars. <laughs> Which isn't a very good answer to your question. The answer is, I don't know. It's a puzzle. It's very strange. It's very, very mysterious. I guess I should try and describe this. You are the people to tell, if anybody is. What I found about this communicating with it thing is that um, sometimes it's easy and it just comes, and that's what the trip is about. But if it's elusive for you, or if you've taken mushrooms many times and yet this doesn't seem to be what happened to you, I couldn't describe how it works for me anyway. It's as though a certain level of intoxication with the mushroom is the precondition for being able to communicate, but is not itself enough. So that I will be, I will feel the levels building in my body, and I will be very stoned, and then I will come into this place where I will say, now it is possible to invoke the spirit in the mushroom. And then I invoke it. And uh, it, it's a pretty straightforward thing. I remember an old I Love Lucy thing where Ethel is asking Lucy how she gets in touch with the flying saucers. And she says, I just say, come in, little green men, come in, little green men. It's almost like that. In fact, it is like that. <laughs> No, they're not green. What I do is I get the feeling, which is, I call it, um, it's almost like, I'm embarrassed to even tell this kind of stuff. It, it, it's a feeling of being very Irish. It's a feeling of <laughs> elfinness. And then I say, aha, we're getting close in. They're ne I smell them. They're nearby. And then I just say, you know, show, show, show. And there's this music, this tinkling stuff. And it begins to get stronger. So I say, you know, come in, little green men, come in. And then it, it gets louder and louder. And then finally, once you get the valve open, you don't have to worry. It will pour through as long as you can watch it and be with it and sing with it. And it is obviously the basis for the idea of elves and elfin energy and little people who make jeweled machines and play musical instruments and live in the mountains. Terrence, did you, uh, do you know how in the very first instance that you began to, you must have learned in some way how to invoke this, to say, come in, come in, come in. And, and some, some, you stumbled into it some way. I, I, can you recount that incident? Do you remember that? Sure. The way it happened to me was uh, someone in 1967, just a few months after I'd begun taking LSD, somebody brought DMT to me and said, without any introduction, they just said, here's something you might be interested in. It's a drug. And I said, how long does it last? And they said, five minutes. I said, okay. <laughs> Thinking, five minutes, what can it be, you know? And what happens with with DMT is you leap over all the barriers in 
the first few seconds. Unlike mushrooms, where over hours and hours on a high dose you might navigate yourself to the center of the mandala, DMT is like being struck by metaphysical lightning. I mean, the main question is, what the hell happened? Because it immediately took me to this place I had never suspected existed, you know, this dome-like, brilliantly lit space where these self-transforming machine organic things were all around me and leaping through my body and singing and making objects and showing all this stuff to me. And it was like just all the veils were torn away in a single moment. And then that inspired me to look at the chemistry and then the botany and the shamanism and to try and make my way back to that place at not quite such a super voltage. And that was the raison d'etre for going to the Amazon because those drugs in the Amazon, those plant combinations are working off the same chemicals. It was the reason for being into the mushrooms because the mushroom really experientially and chemically it's fair it's quite reasonable to call it a slow release dmt trip dmt is quite an astonishing thing i don't understand how they manage to keep it secret because it's the convincer you know it's for the person who thinks these things only work if you're soft-headed because it's just it raises all the questions in a hurry it's so intense and so oriented toward the other and the visual and the hallucinogenic that it isn't really like a drug. It's more like an event that you ran into. You just came around a corner and there was the unspeakable. I don't know if I would have ever... Uh, I was lucky in that sense. A lot of people take psychedelics a lot, I think, and never quite realize just what it is that they have their hands on because you need these ego-threatening, if not life-threatening experiences somewhere along the way to hip you to just how intense uh, this can be. There's nothing any more intense this side of the grave than a strong psychedelic experience. Did you I begin then to, once you've done the DMT, did you begin then to, as you would work, work with the psilocybin or the mushrooms, did you begin to... And since it's slower, you would you began to have some kind of recognition that you needed to invoke more and more, and you began to... Did it take a ritual form, for example? Well, or what, did you do the same thing each time? Or? What seemed most astonishing to me in these D early DMT trips was that there was language that I hadn't expected, that what's going on in the DMT trip, besides the body transformations and the visual hallucinations and the little alien entities, is... They are speaking to you, and you are understanding, and yet they're speaking in a language which is visible, which is, it's pure magic, it's pure linguistic intent, which you behold with your eyes, and you feel like Moses before the burning bush or something. You just say, my God, I didn't know humans were wired for this kind of a thing. What is it? And then for many years I smoked DMT and contemplated it, and on DMT it comes very, very fast. It's like spun gold and mercury, you know, and supremely intricate and supremely worked and rapid. And my dream was to be able to slow it down, to be able to do it, to be able to show it to people. And I read Robert Graves' The White Goddess, and had the notion in there, you know, he talks about a, pri a uh, primary poetic language that he thinks existed before history that was so from the bone and the flesh of people that anyone could understand it. It wasn't like Japanese and Iranian and American English. It was from the bones, not from the place. And poetry made in this language had the power not only to move people's hearts and to open their souls, but to actually cause them to see realities pass before their eyes, and that these poets were using sound and language to do something that we have only 
the faintest, faintest memory of. And what the DMT beings seemed to be saying was, this art can be brought back. This visible language, this poetry made manifest is what you should learn to do. And all the trips were about, see what we're doing? Do this, do this. And, tr- and eventually, I was able to do it on psilocybin. And then it, it was apparent to me that it's gibberish. <laughs> and uh, that I had uh, somehow missed the mark or that you have to be stoned, or that there are parts still to be learned. This is a very persistent theme in these deep psychedelic things, I think, is something is trying to be communicated that is not on the love one another level, but more like fold flap A to flap B, that kind of thing. There is concern to communicate the construction of something. And when I realized this and then looked back through mythology, it's always been there. The Mandaeans, who were a Gnostic cult uh, of the even the pre-Christian period, had the notion that when the Messiah for them came, he would construct a machine of some sort. They'd call it this. That he would construct a machine and that the machine would then pump all the souls to the moon and then from there they would be taken care of in some way. But it was the miss the missing link was a machine which the second Adam would come and build. Cat had this experience of the structure of the flying saucer when we were in the Amazon in 71. It was all about how do you build a trans-dimensional vehicle with the help of elfin advice. And it was molecular. It was interiorized. It had something to do with sound. You sing it into existence, but it has something to do with DNA. It's a technology that is fantasy for us, except that you can feel that this has always been the Pythagorean faith, that color, sound, angle of attack, all of these things could go together to produce uh, a super technology and a vehicle. And in the deep psychedelic states, there always seems to be uh, either the concern with building something, imparting information about a plan, or the other persistent motif that people have is uh, that the world is going to win and that there will be intervention of some spectacular sort, the second coming, flying saucers, something like that. Now, why these motifs exist, I don't know. I've talked at times about what I call the transcendental object at the end of time, And I think maybe what human history is, is a kind of collective psychedelic trip where we are closing in on the mystery at the center of the mandala, sort of the shamanic gift, difficult to obtain. And what it is, of course, is it's the human soul realized, realized, And I almost said realized as a technology, but the realizing of it in any form would realize it as a technology. So that really history is the siren song of the soul, the saucer song of the soul, the group mind coming into existence through our efforts over several thousand years, something first glimpsed in dreams and then glimpsed in, you know, higher mythologies, and then glimpsed in technological visions and in psychedelic states, and finally actually invoked into history in such a way that its reality is incontrovertible, then history ends. I don't understand why anyone could be moved to say such crazy things, but uh, it seems to be the content of... uh, of the experience. Now, of course, if any of you are psychologists, you recognize this as a syndrome uh, 
grandiose delusions, messiah complex, uh, misplaced reference. It has different kinds of names. It means you think that you're going to be present or a part of the most important thing that ever happened. It's a serious form of mental illness, uh, <laughs> unless it's true. <laughs> and you don't find out uh, until it's too late. So. Yes. Once the psychoactivity was discovered, the real visionary potential of the mushroom, I think it would be connected to the cow. It would be viewed as a product of the cow in the same way that the manure, the hide, the milk, the blood, and the flesh was. And it's significant that in the Middle East, at the very earliest stratum of culture that is anything other than the chipping of flint, there are images of cattle. Cattle everywhere. Cattle at Altamira, cattle at Lascaux, painted very, very sensitively. What, what the ancient cave art of North Africa and Southern Europe is, is a celebration of women and cattle. Men appear as stick figures wielding spears. Women are drawn as uh, filled-in, curvilinear structures, their fecundity, their pregnancy, in many cases, their physical beauty. I don't know how many of you know the paintings of the Tasselli frescoes in Algeria, but there are paintings of seated women that are as good as anything Monet or Gauguin did. I mean, where it, it's feeling, you know, it's the curve of the hip, and the incurve of the back and the swell of the belly under the breast. I mean, this is, uh, it's figure, figurative drawing as good as we do today. So women and cattle at the very earliest uh, stratum of consciousness are mixed together. We always talk about this early level of culture as hunting, gathering. And I think that we drop our voices. We say it's a hunting, gathering culture. <laughs> if you've spent time in the Amazon, you know that what this means is once a month or once every six weeks, the men get their act sufficiently together and they make up enough coca that they all go get their bows and arrows and they go off for a hunt and leave the women and the children behind and get all coked up and uh, hunt and party all night. And then when the coca is all gone, because usually women make the coca, when the coca is all gone, whatever they've captured on the hunt, they triumphantly carry back to the village. And often, you know, it's garbage. And the women will be waiting at the village for them to come back and say, you know, eight days in the woods and you bring back one maggoty agouti? You know, what kind of clowns are you people? <laughs> but this is the hunt, you know, and the hunter is the hero and they'll tell the story around the campfire. Meanwhile, what is really going on, as is always the case, is that women are gathering. And gathering is a highly conscious activity where, you know, this plant is okay, that plant is bad, the root of this plant is poisonous, but if pound with, pounded with water and washed, becomes edible. It's, in, it's, an intelli it's an activity that demands discrimination, intelligence, a body of lore, memory, uh, powers of observation, so forth and so on. It is, in fact, uh, serious business. While this hunting thing exists almost to keep the men out of the women's hair. <laughs> so, you can imagine that the visual acuity thing had as great an impact on the gathering as it did on the hunting. Because in many plants, it's very hard to tell the poison from the non-poison. And, and also, you gain, there are forms of visual acuity that are so removed from our awareness that we don't even recall them, such as being able to track an animal, or being able to tell where animals have been, or being able to tell just by the color of a landscape where the water is flowing under the ground 
and therefore where certain kinds of plants will occur. All of these cognitive activities, these integrative activities that rely on observation and memory, were tremendously aided by the presence of an imagination-enhancing enzyme in the food chain. And the goddess religions of the ancient Middle East are nothing more than uh, the tail end of this. It it went on for 15,000 years and then it began to fade out about 5,000 years ago. The imagination, the Living in the Imagination conference we just had, we were very, very fortunate to have Rian Eisler come in and talk to us. If you're not aware of her work, I urge you to look into it. Rian Eisler wrote The Chalice and the Blade, and she is a brilliant woman, archaeologist, a refugee from Nazi Europe, and her notion is, you know, that not that there was a patriarchy in prehistory and then we fell in, I mean a matriarchy, and then we fell into patriarchy and that this has been the problem. She has managed to de-genderize the cultural debate by inventing the terms partnership, culture, and dominator culture. We live in a dominator culture, and so do the English, in spite of Margaret Thatcher. It's not about women, and it's not about men. It's about feminine and masculine attitudes. And uh, Rian, using the work of Maria Gambutas and other people, has made a brilliant case that... uh, the, the natural uh, equilibrium state of human society is to be in a partnership culture where uh, higher, the only hierarchies are hierarchies of function. People do what they can do well, but an administrator is not a more advanced member of society than a gardener. Nothing is seen to be intrinsically somehow higher or lower. There are just functions performed by people. Well, the great hope that she holds out is that if we recognize that what happened was simply a mistake, the allowing of the dominator model to come into being, then recognizing it as a mistake, we can simply correct the mistake. So she offers tremendous hope it's not a we are doomed and, you know, the selfish gene, that rap, or the territorial imperative, that rap, or all of these we're doomed kind of raps that come out of sociobiology and that kind of thing. We're not doomed at all. Now, what I've hoped to do and, and want to do is accept Rian's premise that there was... Uh, a partnership culture that around 1500 B.C. died out completely, its last stand being Minoan Crete, and that it was then replaced by a uh, dominator culture. What I, I accept all that. What I want to know is why? How could such a thing have happened? If a model of culture, an adaptation like that, had been perfected that worked, what factor could then come into the picture and overturn it and cause it to be lost? And I think what it is, is uh, the, the partnership culture maintain, was feminized in its approach to society because it maintained a connection to the psychedelic world through plants. It kept a proper perspective on the true um, rank of import of the structures of the psyche. Because as soon as you get the fall of Minoan Crete, what you get is the beginnings of Greek philosophy. And when you get formal philosophy... You, and you get the rise of the Homeric period. All this happened about the same time. We're talking 1100 BC here in the Eastern Mediterranean. You get the glorification of the marauder, the warrior, the glorification of the king, and, uh, and the uh, evolution of slavery 
in the Greek model that we kept up with right up until 1865. The slaves of ancient Egypt were the property of the royal household. Slaveholding was not something that everybody was into, as it was later, where wealth meant slaves. So I think that what the psychedelic thing can be seen as is in, when it's done with plants is a return to Gaia, an immersion in the feminine. Uh, James Joyce talks about what he calls the mama matrix most mysterious. That's what you're seeing, those lights against darkness, all that stuff. It is the potential for creative exuberance that resides in the phonic feminine matrix. It is the body of the goddess. And the ego can only create and maintain its tiny world of self-reflective concerns if it stifles this connection to the unconscious. So the terror of drugs that is paralyzing our society is there's really only one terror in our society. It's the terror of the feminine. And the terror of drugs is a terror of giving up control. This is what people are most alarmed about by psychedelics, is the giving up control. And remember in the 60s it was all about ego loss, and people strove for it and claimed to have achieved it, and this and that. And it was never couched in this male-female thing, but uh, I think that's a male problem, and a male way of uh, sort of of setting the table for the banquet to talk about ego loss. A partnership society is going to involve a lot of ego loss. It's going to involve a lot of seeing your brother and your sister as interchangeable with yourself. It's going to bring, I think, a major sexual revolution because... So much of sexuality over the past 500 years has been based on, it was almost the coinage of the ego's dealings with the world. How many women are under my domination? Uh, are you mine? Am I yours? It, and people have always stressed that the problem was in the possession, but it's really in the casting of the subject and the object there. My, me and you, not the relationship. And so I have, uh, I'm sure you've all heard me say this on tape, to me the major metaphor that is operating in the 20th century is what I call the archaic revival. We are, our civilization is falling to pieces. Its assumptions are no longer any good. It just doesn't work. And by our civilization, I mean from Moscow to the Potomac to Tokyo to Sydney to Bangkok and back to Paris. Global civilization is not working. It may still be working in the rainforest, but only if we haven't reached them yet. And as soon as we reach them, they'll be sent to work in sawmills and uh, involved in growing coca for the drug trade and and be ruined. When a society is in trouble the way we are in trouble, what it does unconsciously, it just in the same way that a drowning person reaches outward, is it reaches outward for a previous cultural metaphor to stabilize itself. We can understand this by looking at the Renaissance where as the medieval world began to crack to pieces uh, and cynicism about the church and the pope and all of this and cities began to... and the Jews began to be turned loose to make money and trading networks began to be established. All of these new things began to be tolerated. The Renaissance reached back to Greece and Rome for steadying metaphors. And this is what classicism is. It's an effort to be more like Greece and Rome than Greece and Rome were. To have their laws, their architecture, 
uh, their uh, technologies, theories of road building, warfare, and politics. Uh, in our situation, the culture crisis is much worse because of the bomb, because it is global, because of high-speed communication. We, we, can't become, we can't reach back to ancient Egypt or the Anastasi or the Maya. It has to be something further back. It actually has to be something outside of history. And this is what sets the stage for the archaic revival. We want to return to the cultural models of 15 to 20,000 years ago. Not that we are going to become uh, Neolithic people, but we need to cultivate the same things they cultivated for very different reasons. They were hunter-gatherers with a deep sensitivity to nature in order that their very small numbers could uh, prosper and spread. We must be, become gardeners of the planet and ecologically conscious people because otherwise there won't be any land left to stand on. Their concern with myth and ritual, with images from the unconscious expressed in mask making and carving and fetishes, we see early in the 20th century's concern for the great revolution in art. So Picasso went to West Africa and brought these masks back and other people brought back primitive art and it was seen to be you know, more true to the human feelings of the early 20th century than the romantic fin de siècle art that had come before, which was really the last tail wagging of the Baroque and Rococo era, which was the come down from the Renaissance. So modern art, the discoveries of Freud and Jung, that there was more to life than being awake or asleep, but that there were, you know, spirits, the rebirth of a sense of spiritual values. You know, at mid-century, it looked like we were all going to become French intellectuals, existential, atheistic, Marxist, uh, just this flat, flat, empty thing. Jean-Paul Sartre's statement on nature is, nature is mute. Nature has nothing to say to man. Well, this is, to my mind, you know, a monstrous statement designed to lead people astray. If nature is mute, no wonder the existentialists felt lost. They had precluded the one connection to authentic being that was available to them. So, um, I see the psychedelic experience as both the centerpiece of prehistoric life and destined to be the centerpiece of any future that we want to be part of. I mean, we can imagine fascist futures, futures of vast regimentation and machine-like behavior where everyone is reduced to uh, just being an automaton within a vaster automaton. But these are not futures we want to live with. A humane future is going to, as I said last night, place the expansion of consciousness in its very center. And this means accepting the role of the feminine, not as political rhetoric, but as the facts of the matter. I don't know if I told this group last night, but... Uh, I always think of what Chesterton said. He said, men are men, but man is a woman. And that's the fact of the matter. And by realizing that man is a woman, you, there's, no, there's no debate. It's not a discussion. There's no convincing. It's just a fact, like that water runs downhill. And you're going to have to get straight about it. Then there is a possibility for uh, fitting ourselves into a partnership future. Rianne has thought this all out in her head, theoretically. I don't know whether she is a psychedelic uh, traveler or not, but she and I immediately had lots to say to each other because she 
has, you could say, found her way there by another route. Uh, the tension in the world is the tension between the ego and the feminine not between the masculine and the feminine. And everyone who has an ego, and many women in positions of power do, has an unresolved problem with this ego-feminine thing. The return to the archaic mode gives permission for this to happen, and the psychedelic experience stabilizes it, because women are always at home with the mystery, probably because they are the ones who give birth, and they are usually the ones who make dying, uh, ease the way of the dying. So I don't think women have this desire for neatness and closure that dominates men. Men want it to be straightforward, well-organized, move on time, no mystery. Science, as the great enterprise of paternalism, has come to the end of its road. It has not only swept the kitchen, it's now sweeping the yard. And as it sweeps the yard, it's sinking deeper and deeper in the earth because there's no floor on reality. There is a science, and they are beginning to admit this and say, well, there's something wrong. We thought we, it would be one more particle or one more something or other, and it just seems to endlessly recede in front of us. This is not a problem. This is a solution. This is what science has been needing to hear for 500 years is enough already. We now have a science which can do anything or almost anything we want technologically. So that's its tool-making function. It's fulfilled that very nicely. Why do we believe that it will elucidate the mysteries of the soul? It won't. That's another concern. It's a concern of individuals. You want to understand a mystery of the soul, you don't get a $5 billion budget and a team of six universities linked by computer to attack it. No, you go into the wilderness and you eat mushrooms. It's that kind of work. It's more the work of the poet than the work of the research scientist. And certainly in the archaic mode, the poet was uh, the model for men and women. I mean, poet has a masculine connotation in our society, but that's because we're so screwed up. We even had a separate word for women poets, a poetess, you see. But the making of poetry, the living in the primal world of poetry, can only be done if you have a direct connection to the mystery. And that cannot happen as long as the ego is the god. We were in the conference last week kidding around down at the baths and I was saying that I had invented the smallest form of memory that memories were made of particles and that the smallest particle of memory was called a nemon and then somebody said well if memories are made of particles then is consciousness made of particles I said well maybe it is well then what shall we name the smallest unit of consciousness. And Kat said, uh, how about calling it the ego? <laughs> and I think that's a good place to begin. Let's get it in its proper perspective. The ego is the smallest amount of consciousness anybody can deal with in the ordinary world. But uh, you build outward from the ego. You put two egos together and maybe you've either got uh, a uh, conflict, which is always interesting, or better yet, a love affair. Well, you put three egos together and you've got a menage a trois. Four and you have a corporation, and so forth and so on. So complexity of consciousness arrives out of building on the atom of the ego, not trying to squeeze everything down into it, the uh, intellectual richness of our heritage is unimaginable. It is our greatest legacy. 
I mean, you can forget your fleets of Rolls Royces and that Monet that they're holding for you in Paris and your summer house on Ibiza. It's nothing compared to the richness of the imagination. Not William Blake's imagination or uh, Donatello or Caravaggio, but your imagination. There's more and better art in your head than is hanging on the walls of the great galleries of art of this planet. That's what makes history so exciting, because we have just begun. We really are just shaking the leaves out of our hair and scraping the lice out of our fur and beginning to talk about how we could have a civilization here. We could have a sane planet with sane people living on it, leading happy, productive lives, with everybody with enough to eat, everybody getting laid enough, everybody getting to be famous enough, everybody getting what they need by abandoning this, uh, you know, I think it was Freud who compared the, the gathering of money to the retention of shit to the holding of your stuff, you know, to being that possessive and that crazed about the products of your own, uh, your own psyche and body. The role that psychedelics play in this, if, if I haven't made clear enough, is that they caused it, they maintain whatever of it has gone on through the dark centuries of monotheism when these things were forbidden, and I'm, I put it that way in order to jibe Muslims, Jews, and Christians equally because we all have shared in the carrying forward of a really odd idea. And, uh, uh, and psychedelics now, as we decondition ourselves from the post-medieval world, they are present to hand as tools. And I think people such as yourselves know this, it, what we need to do is create a common language. In the 60s, the odd thing was everybody agreed that LSD was very, very important, but nobody could really say how it was important outside of the fact that it had been important to them. And I think if you give permission to look at the role in the, of the plants and of shamanism and of the mystery religions, do your homework go back into history and see how it worked, then you see that the real revolution is going to be the realization that if it weren't for psychedelics, we wouldn't even be here. This thing that we're so concerned to deny and repress in our society, which is drugs, is the sine qua non of being. Not bad drugs. I'm not advocating cocaine addiction, heroin use, that sort of thing. We will talk at some other time about habits and the habit of having habits. But uh, those are creatures of the laboratory, pernicious imps that have been summoned forth by the scientific establishment and let loose in society to really confuse the issue. Uh, if I could, by an act of fiat, uh, change the linguistic world around, I would make it impossible to use the word drugs to talk about what we're talking about. Drugs are things, medicine for ill people, coming out of the laboratory, coming out of uh, theories of medicine that come out of mechanistic science. Plants are what we're talking about, and I've I used to sort of shy away from the word magic, but more and more I come to, I've come to like it because it makes the right people so uptight. And say, so just talk about magic plants. Who's going to bust you for magic plants? You say, you mean drugs? No, just magic plants. Say, oh, I see. Well, you're an airhead, so... Uh. <clears throat> but, uh, so what I'm tr talking about this morning is my hope that the awareness of psychedelics as a personal force in each of your lives, I don't think I have to talk to you about that. You're self-selected for being here, and you know that. What I want to talk about 
is how important it is to re-understand our history, to re-understand that this is us. We didn't get to this place by ourselves. What distinguishes us from the other primates is that we formed a symbiotic relationship with a mystery. And the mystery is an intelligence on this planet we can't say how long, at least as long as we have been here, may have come from the stars, could be an extraterrestrial intellect, could be the dark recesses of our own mind that we have evolved so far from that we cannot recognize, but we might as well treat it like an extraterrestrial because no extraterrestrial that we are going to meet is going to be as alien as this thing that we have found in ourselves. The aliens of Hollywood who come in metallic ships with an interest in our atomic power plants or our redwood trees or whatever are just like the guy living next door compared to the entities that we find in our own mind. So it doesn't do any good to psychologize the alien and say, as Jung attempted to say, well, it's the autonomous other. Autonomous psychic components in the human mind present themselves as elves, fairies, sprites, and aliens. Once you've met an elf, a sprite, a fairy, or an alien, you realize that waving the wand that says this is a component of your own psyche is just ludicrous. It's as ludicrous as me waving a wand at you and announcing that that's gotten rid of your existential validity because you're a part of my own psyche. You know, it's uh, madness when applied to another person, and I think it's equally appropriate when applied to, uh, to these entities contract contacted in the trance. To do that, to try to reduce it, to say, well, it's just the one part of my head talking to another, is to fall into this paternalistic scientific desire to have it all be very neat. How would it be if it's not neat at all? How would it be if nobody really knows what's going on? How would it be if understanding what reality is actually depended for you upon you? And that book by Fritz of Capra that you paid 1895 for isn't going to do it. And neither is sitting at the feet of some guru that it's serious business. And the first thing to understand is that nobody knows, that, that you're not looking for a teacher. It hasn't been found out. It's not sitting on the shelf of some library. It is being figured out now, and your job is to die with the state of the art understanding having emerged into your mind five minutes before you got there. And then, you know, that will carry you through. We need to awaken to the adventure and the richness and the openness of the game. The rules have not yet been forged. We will forge the rules ourselves, each for ourselves and each for the rest of us by working forward through this thing. Uh, I think we're at the very beginnings of grappling and dealing with the psychedelic era. We are like people talking about evolution in 1855. You know, a few of us have read Darwin's paper. Nobody's sure exactly what it means. It's a strong intuition of something. The species thing is a problem. Nobody's quite sure. Uh, there's uh, a new model of life and culture ahead of us, and it comes out of exploring with each other the places we have been by ourselves, the places that we have gone and been taken by the Spirit. I'd like to add something sure, to this Nina. wonderful thing that Chesterton said about man being a woman. I think the essence of the psychedelic experience is surrender. Yes. And surrender is a feminine thing. That's it's right. It's terribly difficult for most men That's right. to surrender. Mm -hmm. That's right. And women surrender when they give birth. I mean, you, you must. In, I mean, if it's natural childbirth, you know, you just realize this tiger has you. 
and there's no backing out, walking away, postponing, skipping over. And yes, so it's the tension between the ego and surrender, and the psychedelics mean surrender. I want to talk, I hope, I, I thought I talked somewhat about the problem of the alien. Uh, it's a rich problem, and people probably have experiences which weigh upon it. It's really in the particulars of meeting this thing. If, some, I'm, if someone had never taken psychedelics and had no interest in it, and had come here because they thought this was the triggering group, I think they would be truly alarmed and disturbed by what they hear, because we appear to be mad people because we appear to be fully engaged with an unseen, invisible world, and we're calling it the cause of history, the purpose for the future, and the basis for everything going on between us. But uh, nobody said life was simple, because every single person uh, who does this is seeing things no human eye has ever fallen upon, and uh, it is a realm of ideas, and we do each bring back different souvenirs from that place. We are all equally qualified. We don't know who will spot the whale, but everyone should have their eye peeled, because that's what we're doing. We're searching for an encounter with Leviathan. Nature is God. That was the informing vision of Moby Dick, and... Uh, it's a good one to carry as a metaphor into, this, into the psychedelic experience. There again was a perfect example of the male ego unable to release into the matrix of nature until it literally dragged them into the depths. But thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>